I am Sheldon Kotelecki, the president of the New England chapter, and I am delighted to have you here and welcome you all aboard. And for those of you who are coming to the dinner tonight, we look forward to seeing you again uh, during the reception and then chatting during the dinner. So it should be a very fun uh, gala evening for all of us. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to the Bullfinch Chair this year, David Andriozzi, and he will introduce the speaker. Welcome. Um, I just want to remind everybody to turn your cell phones off if you haven't already. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you to our uh, keynote lecturer tonight for the sixth annual Bullfinch Awards, Justin Shubo. Mr. Shubo, a vigorous proponent of classicism, graciously joins us from Washington, D.C., where he is the cu current president of the National Civic Arts Society. Founded in 2002, the NCAS promotes the classical and humanist tradition in public art and architecture. NCAS is motivated not just by aesthetic concerns, as important as they are, but moral and political considerations. NCAS agrees with Thomas Jefferson, who said, design, activity, and political thought are indivisible. In his role, Mr. As president, Mr. Shubo has indirectly become a leading figure in the current emerging classical revival, particularly through his columns for Forbes magazine online. Through his writing, activism, and testimony in Congress and elsewhere, he has personally spearheaded the popular opposition to the proposed Frank Gehry design for the National Memorial to Dwight Eisenhower. In a world that seems to only celebrate modernism, Mr. Shubo has become a beacon for the entire classical movement of art, architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design, giving us a platform to re-educate the public and our leaders on the importance of using our history and culture as a datum upon which design decisions should be made irrespective of style. Mr. Shubo received his JD at Yale Law. He spent four years at the University of Michigan PhD program in philosophy. He has taught his own philosophy courses at Michigan and Yale. Mr. Shubo sits on the board of academic advisors for the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Please join the New England chapter and the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art to welcome Mr. Justin Shubo. It's truly an honor to be speaking here today. I would like to thank David and Sheldon and the ICA New England chapter for inviting me to speak. I want to apologize for my informal attire. Southwest Airlines misplaced my bag last night. <laughs> Oscar Wilde once said, one can never be too overeducated or overdressed. And I just hope that my <laughs> underdressed uh, nature is not indicative of my lack of formal training in architecture. <laughs> As David mentioned, I'm the president of the National Civic Art Society. We begin with the premise that a civilization's most important architecture is its civic art and architecture, since these structures are consciously intended to express ideas and values. They speak to who we are as a people and who we wish to be. And here is uh, one of my favorite images of the importance of our civic art. This is in the Lincoln Memorial in the movie Mr. Swift, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, one of the first things he does when he goes to Washington is visit this memorial. And here we see three different generations um, in the memorial looking at the Gettysburg Address. After much of the British Parliament was severely damaged by German bombing in World War II, Winston Churchill gave a speech calling for rebuilding the Parliament exactly as it was. And he famously said, we shape our buildings, and thereafter our buildings shape us. Like Pericles, the builder of the Parthenon in ancient Athens, all great statesmen have under, understood the importance of architecture for the body politic, including evil geniuses like Hitler and Stalin, both of whom were architects in their own right. As Mies van der Rohe said, architecture is the true battleground of the spirit. America's founding fathers took great care in choosing the design of the nation's capital and its core buildings of government. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson personally oversaw the competitions to design the Capitol and the White House, 
and they influenced the designs themselves. As you likely know, both were also talented architects in their own right. Jefferson advised Americans that, quote, architecture is among the most important arts and it is desirable to introduce taste into an art which shows so much. He had great ambitions for a new American architecture. He aimed, quote, to improve the taste of my countrymen, to increase their reputation, to reconcile them to the respect of the world, and procure them its praise. Washington and Jefferson consciously decided that the plan of Washington, D.C. and its most important structures were to be classical in design, the physical manifestation of the American form of government and its political aspirations, including such values as good order, benevolent hierarchy, and reason. This decision connected the capital to the ideals of Republican Rome and Democratic Athens, and from our vantage point, we can also say their choices um, evince the mindset of the Enlightenment, the age of reason. Believing the classical tradition to be time-honored and timeless, Jefferson expressed his personal desire for a capital designed after, quote, one of the models of antiquity which have had the approbation of thousands of years. He also said he believed that the noble architecture of antiquity is the constant measure of permanent values. The founders invented a national idiom using the traditional vocabulary and grammar from the classical world. The White House and Capitol, the National Mall, and the plan for the entire city, they are universally recognized symbols of the United States that we take pride in. The founders intentionally situated their day and age within the two millennia long tradition of classicism. They recognized its dignity, its aspiration to beauty, its harmony with the natural world and human perception, and its capability of expressing meaning to the citizens it serves. They were founders and framers, not just in government, but in architecture. They understood the wisdom of the past and adapted and approved upon it. The National Civic Art Society exists to defend and further the national idiom the founders created and which was the dominant gov government style until the mid 20th century. Here's just a, an image of a run of the mill post office Bozar Post Office from you know, probably around 1910. And here is the Federal Triangle in Washington, D.C., built in 1921. At this time, um, the classical style was the official style for federal architecture. NCIS seeks civic design that embodies America's highest ideals. We are not conservatives or reactionaries in architecture or politics. We represent the 99% the vast majority of Americans who prefer traditional architecture and as for cultural values, we represent the widespread general consensus. Within the world of architecture, however, we represent the counterculture. The 1%, or really the 0.1% we oppose is the architectural establishment, which is dominated by the ideology of modernism, a term I use widely to include postmodernism and deconstructionism. I call modernism an ideology because it is a rigid belief system grounded in theory that admits of no alternatives or dissent. Like many other modern ideologies, modernist architecture was founded via innumerable competing manifestos, but they do have a common core. All of them assert that architecture must follow the zeitgeist, zeitgeist the so-called spirit of the times. Architecture must flow from the inevitable unfolding of capital H history, the self-revealing logic of its era. It is a kind of metaphysical faith in the progress of history. Virtually all the architectural manifestos proclaimed ideologies opposed to the individual person. Only the collective mattered, the mass of men. The manifestos utterly rejected tradition in the past and called for a universal revolution in the social order. For instance, one manifesto called for a dictatorship of the machine. Another praised the death of the soul. I don't wish to give a history of modern architecture, but I do wish to make the obvious point that this kind of anti-humanism has never had purchase in America. It is no accident that it was important to, imported into this country largely by Germans. Alas, by the mid-20th century, federal architecture, which was overseen by the General Services Administration, had strayed far from its classical roots. Dominated by modernism, it included the austere, box-like, international style, which, as its name suggests, rejected any regionalism or national identity in design. 
There was also brutalism, a massive, fearsome, fortress-like architecture which originated in Nazi flak towers and British public housing. During the mid-century, the federal government built the generic boxes and steel and glass cages that came to exemplify corporate America and international business. It was the architecture of rational bureaucracy. The aesthetic line between public and private buildings was erased. Federal buildings were indistinguishable from commercial office buildings. This was no accident since many modernists, including Mies van der Rohe, explicitly rejected the idea that buildings should show their purposes. And here are some examples of those mid-century buildings. This is just a sort of federal building you've probably seen many, many times. Another one. Both of these, incidentally, resemble the basic plan of the United Nations of a, a large uh, skyscraper next to a smaller mass. This is by Mies van der Rohe. Here uh, is the JFK Federal Building in Boston. <coughs> GSA con con considers this an, an example of excellence in federal design. Here is the entrance to that building. You can see the excellence. <laughs> Here's a new executive office building just a few blocks away from the White House. At the time, this one was considered old-fashioned and contextual. Here's the notorious FBI headquarters. I call it the Ministry of Fear. Here's a recent courthouse in Baltimore. This is the U.S. Tax Court in Washington, D.C. Perhaps looks all too appropriate um, for when you're going in front of court regarding your taxes. Eventually, there came to be widespread agreement in the government that the Great Society era of modernist architecture was a failure. Aesthetics had been sacrificed for economy and efficiency, as the federal government's own history of its buildings admits, um, the structures were considered mediocre or worse. Many in government and many members of the public found the buildings and the surrounding public spaces to be repellent and alienating. They believed the buildings were miserable places to work and visit. One of the most famous criticisms of these mid-century buildings regards the headquarters for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban, De Urban Development in Washington, D.C., which was completed in 1968. Designed by the leading modernist architect Marcel Breuer, it is a massive, imposing, brutalist bu building cast in raw concrete. Jack Kemp, then secretary of HUD, said the building was like 10 floors of basement. <laughs> Later, in 2009, secretary of HUD Sean Donovan, a Democrat in contrast to Kemp, who was a Republican, said, quote, with its brutalist architecture and exposed concrete, Despite a workforce that is second to none, the building itself is among the most reviled in all of Washington, and with good reason. A predecessor of mine, Jack Kemp, famously said this building was like 10 floors of basement, unquote. Despite all this, the General Services Administration also upholds this as an example of excellence in federal design. GSA is the federal agency responsible for constru constructing all federal buildings, courthouses, and immigration stations. GSA also reserves one half of 1% of the estimated construction cost of each new federal building to commission art for the structure. This is its so-called art and architecture program. This, together with its building portfolio, has made GSA the largest patron of art and architecture in the country. In 1994, GSA's public building service created what it called the Design Excellence Program to remedy what it saw as the many serious flaws of federal architecture over the prior decades. The program's creators bemoaned what they called the lack of, quote, authentic contemporary architecture. One of the founders said the program rejected the concrete bunkers and gun-slit windows of the Great Society buildings. I would respond parenthetically, that the banal buildings I showed precisely represented the banal state of architecture at the time. The Design Excellence Program sought to attract world-renowned private architects for federal projects, the kind of architects who win the most prestigious establishment prizes. Design Excellence seeks quote-unquote innovation and creativity, and it frowns upon anything redolent or of classicism or the past. 
What this has meant is that GSA has needed to persuade federal judges to abandon the classical idiom in favor of modernism. According to Edward Finer, the, creative, the creator of design excellence, the architects have been successful at persuading the judges. He said the judges, quote, come to see that these buildings represent not Greek or Roman ideals, but American ideals. We are using American statesmen, statements and iconography for the first time. Note that he is implicitly saying that Washington, D.C. is not American. Likewise, a leading architect who worked on a new federal courthouse said, quote, the sense of classical solidity was a borrowed expression. Thomas Jefferson brought it into this country. We felt that we didn't have to borrow anymore, that it was our turn to express what we thought justice was. As a result of the Design Excellence Program, GSA has hired some of the most prestigious architects and firms in the country, some of whom have, have built avant-garde and experimental work. Course, courthouses have been GSA's signature projects, and the agency has argu arguably become one of the drivers of American architecture as a whole. Certainly, GSA likes to think so. GSA has been quite proud of its, its successes and highlights its work through glossy publications and its own design awards. Although design excellence has evaded public scrutiny, and certainly scru scrutiny from Congress and the President, it has received a small amount of criticism. For instance, the architect Robert A. M. Stern said, quote, now we're in a period where every courthouse is so different from every other one at a time when the functions of the courts are the same. I'm famously pluralistic, but I think some of the recent GSA designs have been more difficult for the public to understand as courthouses. Once in a while, they've taken on the characteristics of art projects. I like the courthouse as a building type because it is about tradition and continuity. The shape of a courtroom, the arrangement of the ancillary spaces, all grew up side by side with the Constitution and with the judgments and rulings that have been made over time." Unquote. Underlying some of the postmodernist and deconstructionist architecture is some of the architects' postmodernist deconstructionist view of government. They have a negative view towards its authority and legitimacy, and which, consciously or not, they seek to debunk and undermine. To quote the architect Paul Spencer Byard, Contemporary courthouse design makes clear that we are in a bind. The bind comes from a dominant postmodern political emphasis on criminalization, prohibition, and retribution as proper responses to socially undesirable behavior. The only apparent answer to the why of the current state of justice is because I say so. The current political emphasis thus offers the designer very little to celebrate. The design excellence program has been especially important since at the end of the last century, GSA began a 10-year, $10 billion effort to, rebuild, to build more than 50 new courthouses and to significantly alter others. It is for that reason that Esquire magazine called Edward Finer, the chief architect of GSA, the most powerful architect in America. I once attended a small talk by Finer in which he thought he was among friends. He bragged about the lack of oversight from Congress and the President and said, quote, it's amazing what you can do when no one is watching. It's a good thing that President Bush wasn't paying attention. I did record that talk. <laughs> Thanks to design excellence, architects, not the government, have truly been in charge of what is being built. What did GS GSA do when no one was watching? Virtually nothing classical or regionalist. Virtually nothing that even looks like a courthouse. In a number of cases, they built courthouses and federal buildings that resembled prisons. Other design excellence buildings are undistinguished and commercial in appearance. Despite GSA's criticism of the gun slits and the corporate impersonal style of its mid-century buildings, the agency has repeated these same errors. In some cases, design excellence works have incorporated a flashy high-tech style, demonstrating an obsession with the latest building technology, buildings that fail to identify themselves as public architecture. In other cases, the architecture has been bizarre and discomforting. The most notorious new federal works are by the deconstructionist architect Tom Main, whom the New York Times called the federal government's favorite architect. He designed a courthouse in Portland, Oregon, and a federal building in San Francisco. Neither of them look like anything from planet Earth. In a talk at Cornell University, Maine said he designed the courtrooms so that there are quote unquote covert guillotines over the judges' benches. 
Here's that courthouse in Portland. Here's the interior where you get a sense of chaos and disorder from those askew columns. His San Francisco building is even stranger. This, this is a, his federal building. It looks like a schizoid robot about to shoot laser beams at passersby. The front of the building is covered by a steel mesh cage um, from which protrudes strange boxes. The main atrium in the interior is dark and ominous. Here's the side of the building. And I, I have been there and it's actually this dark. Here's another angle. The, bill, the walls are a kilter as are even the railings on the stairs. Everything as, as, is at an angle, like you might say, a building that's been hit by an earthquake. Mm -hmm. This is no accident since Maine has previously mentioned his intent to disorient the public in his works. He once said in an interview, quote, at a time in which the media give the public everything it wants and desires, maybe art should adopt a much more aggressive attitude toward the public. I myself am very much inclined to take this position. According to a Cornell Daily Sun report on his aforementioned talk at the university, quote, Maine admitted to wanting to create demanding art for art's sake architecture that only other architects can appreciate. He described his Cooper Union building in Manhattan as fitting in, in with the FU attitude of the Lower East Side. I now like to show some more examples of the Design Excellence Program. Here's a courthouse in Portland. With, notice those little small windows and what you might say are gun slits on the side. And here's a federal prison or a federal correction center in Chicago. Maybe I'm just seeing things here. Here's a skyscraper. I guess just, you could call this postmodern since there is that enormous cornice on top. Again, another courthouse with gun slits on the side. Here's the other side of that courthouse. The G GSA likes to talk about how their buildings are very American. This is a courthouse in France. I show it to you to compare it to the Sandra Day O'Connor Courthouse by Richard Meyer in Phoenix. So this is one that, like many of these courthouses, have these horizontal uh, thin bands of glass. And in the center, there is this strange rotunda, also made of glass. Here, this is Sing Sing Prison. And maybe there's some similarity there. <laughs> and this is uh, the so-called Panopticon prison design with a guard tower in the center that can watch all the prisoners at the same time. It's sort of a Orwellian nightmare. And here, sorry, you know, maybe we have some kind of Panopticon. Here's a courthouse in Austin, Texas from 2012. This is another one by Richard Meyer. This is in Islip, New York. This building is enormous. Notice it also has those horizontal thin bands of windows. This is the entrance to the courthouse. This one I find interesting in Las Vegas is what do we see in the center here? Well, here is a coastal defense tower with genuine gun slits. Here's a side with some more gun slits. This is the US mission to the United Nations. I don't think it's a building we can take much pride in. Here's a courthouse which has um, fencing over the windows and there's that cage to the left. To me, this is reminiscent of prison design. Recent courthouse by Thomas Pfeiffer in Salt Lake City. This reminds me of the Borg spacecraft from Star Trek. <laughs> and here's one on the way from Skidmore Owings and Mer Merrill in uh, Los Angeles, yet another corporate style. This is one of the rare exceptions of a classical building that slipped through the track, slipped through the cracks. This is uh, by Thomas Beebe in Tuscaloosa. I guess you could say that it's not in an important city, so we'll, we'll let a classicist do the job. Um, 
the only reason this building was built was because there was a federal judge who fought for it and fought uh, vigorously against GSA. Here's another angle. And from what I hear, this building is very popular with the public and the people who have to use it. Here's the pediment. I know that the people that run GSA hate this building, hate it. Modernism has not just ruined federal architecture, it has infected the design of our monuments and memorials. Well, what should our commemorative works achieve? Monuments are civic art that cause us to solemnly reflect on who we are and what we value. They represent the consensus understanding of the subject being commemorated. They are heroic-sized, timeless, and possess grandeur. They present an ideal we aspire to rather than warts in all reality. Sacred and transcendent, they inspire instead of demoralizing us. They must honor, not merely remember their subjects. Monuments are permanent and must appear permanent. Monuments ought, ought to be clear and unequivocal in their meaning. They should evince a few simple ideas in a way that is graspable by ordinary Americans. They must be legible without a guide or a key, and certainly without a visitor center or iPad. Monuments speak to us even without signage. You can be inspired by a monument even if you don't know the person who is being represented. Monuments are not museums, and they should not try to tell stories like a documentary. They are not ink blots that leave things to the interpretation of the visitor. Monuments are statements, not question marks. Modernism has long had a difficult relationship with monuments and memorials. One of the most famous critiques of the making of memorials in the modern age comes from architecture critic Lewis Mumford, who in 1938 wrote, quote, the very notion of a modern monument is a contradiction in terms. If it is a monument, it cannot be modern. And if it is modern, it cannot be a monument. The notion of material survival by the means of the monument no longer represents the deeper impulses of our civilization. Indeed, one has only to behold the monuments that have been built during the last century to observe how hollow the notion is. These Lincoln memorials and Vimy Ridge memorials these are the hollow echoes of an expiring breath, heaps of stone which either confound the work of the living or which are completely irrelevant to the living. Michael Kimmelman, the New York Times architecture critic, also sees no place for monuments in the traditional sense in contemporary America. He writes, quote, centuries ago when public art was commissioned by royalty, aristocrats in the church, official taste was synonymous with high art. Democracy in the modern era altered all that. Official art in a democracy requires consensus, an aesthetic common denominator. But modern art is about one person's vision. The idea of a consensus is antithetical to it. He continued, modern artists love ambiguity and irony. Monument builders don't. For Kimmelman, the demands of modern artists outweigh those of the public. In his view, modernist art ought to triumph over democracy. To offer a telling example of the modernist opposition to traditional memorials, in the 1930s, when John Russell Pope's magnificent classical design for the Jefferson Memorial was proposed, the entire architectural establishment came out against it. Since it was classical, they accused it of not being of its time. After all, this is the 1930s, the era of electricity and airplanes and so on. The faculty of the Columbia School of Architecture denounced it as, quote, a lamentable misfit in time and place, Joseph Hudnut, the influential dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design, mocked it as the egg on a pantry shelf in the middle of a geometric Sahara. Thankfully, demonstrating the kind of cultural confidence so often lacking in our leaders today, FDR personally intervened and made sure the design was built over those objections. I'd now like to show a few recent examples of what I see as the decline of American memorials. This is the FDR memorial by Lawrence Halperin. It's a series of outdoor rooms that you walk through. It's like a theme park or a history museum. Here's one of the images of FDR, not very flattering. This is, I guess, the most important assemblage in the memorial. Here we have FDR next to his cute little dog, Fala. Why Fala is there is unclear to me. Here we generally have, um, genuinely have warts on his face, also unflattering. 
Here's the little dog, which gets a lot of attention. People take cute little photos with it. It's really the highlight. And of course, anyone could have predicted that. Here's the bread line, inspired by the burgers of Calais by Rodin, but I don't think it's sufficiently serious enough, and therefore people also take cute photos with it. The entire memorial um, makes it unclear that FDR actually achieved positive things, that he got us out of the Depression and won the war. It has a very depressing feel to it. Here we have the Martin Luther King Memorial, designed by Lee Lechin. Um, he is a socialist realist sculptor who had previously done statues of giant statues of Mao Zedong in China. And many people believe that this design re resembles that. It's called the Stone of Hope. The, the block in which King is sculpted is supposed to have come out of that um, air sats looking mountain in the, pa in the back. I mean, it's actually made of stone, but to me it looks like something like paper mache, something you'd find at Disneyland. Um, King's arms have been put in an angry position. The, 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 the design is based on a photograph of King in contemplation, where his arms are crossed like this, but the sculptor decided to switch it like this. Uh, many people believe it doesn't look like King, and that his clothes are definitely, you know, there's something wrong with them. To me, this looks like the flare of a mountain jacket, buttoned the wrong place. He's not wearing his wedding band. Also, the quotations on the memorial are all second rate. They don't quote his iconic lines. And the explanation that has been given is, well, everybody already knows those. Also, the memorial doesn't contain the words God or even reverend a single time. It strips uh, King of his religious uh, identity. Here's a close up. This is the Pentagon 9-11 memorial. It's a series of benches or diving boards, unclear what they are. And there's some strange numerology about which way they're facing. And then there's a wall that goes from three inches to some other height, it's supposed to represent something about three-year-olds to other ages. And I think it's fair to say that this design says nothing about those attacks. It's totally meaningless and nihilistic. Here it is at night. To me, makes me think of the original War of the Worlds movie, and which you know it's particularly unfortunate since you could say the 9/11 attacks were a, were a war of worlds. Here's the unveiling of the memorial. <laughs> I like this photo because it shows that the emperor's new clothes is not just a story. <laughs> The National Civic Art Society exists to fight these trends in civic art and architecture. We do so not just through our activism, but by educating the public through tours, seminars, and talks. But we also wish to influence policy at the highest levels. We seek to educate our leaders, including members of Congress, and we wish to influence how presidents and other decision makers make key appointments that oversee art and architecture policy. This includes the bureaucrats who run GSA's public building service. By going directly to the levers of power, we're doing an end run around the architectural establishment. Our efforts regarding the Eisenhower Memorial, have, the planned Eisenhower Memorial, have demonstrated that our leaders are, in fact, amenable to reason. In 1999, Congress authorized the creation to a national memorial to President Eisenhower and created the Eisenhower Memorial Commission to build it. The commission is a bipartisan commission consisting of four senators, four representatives, and four laymen. As you likely know, um, oh, and I should say that Frank Gehry was ultimately chosen to design the memorial. As you likely know, Gehry is arguably the world's most famous architect, probably the most lauded. He is the star architect of all star architects. Some of his works have been great financial and popular successes others failures. Gary is a leading light among the architectural avant-garde. He has well summarized his deconstructionist philosophy, quote, life is chaotic, dangerous, and surprising. Buildings should reflect that. He's also said, 
I try to rid myself and the other members of the firm of the burden of the culture and look for new ways to approach the work. There are no rules, no right or wrong. I'm confused as to what's ugly and what's pretty. Gary wholesale rejects tradition in the past. Furthermore, he has repeatedly stated his rejection of harmony as a principle of architecture and urban planning. His inclination is to clash, to interrupt a symphony with a noisemaker. Given how little sense, um, and let me give a, show a few images of Gary's most famous buildings. Here is his Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, probably inspired by the shape of a whale. This building is so big that you can fit Notre Dame in, inside the interior. Here's his uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. And here, a uh, Center for Brain Health. <laughs> now, the obvious joke is, it looks like a patient designed it. And I should say that the interior is so disorienting that certain patients have to be kept in certain er only in certain areas. Given how little sense it made for the flamboyant Gary to be chosen to design a memorial to the old-fashioned subdued Eisenhower, a memorial in a city renowned for its classical architecture, well, you might ask, how did the architect get the job? In 2001, at the Eisenhower Commission's first meeting, its chairman, Rocco Siciliano, said they should get someone like Gary to design the memorial. Turns out that Rocco and Gary are friends. He said the same thing again in 2005 and in 2006. He spoke of conversations he had with Gary about designing the memorial. And lo and behold, when the quote-unquote competition was finally held in 2008, Gary won. We later discovered evidence strongly suggesting he was a preordained winner. The competition was flawed in numerous ways. The first error was the decision to use GSA's Design Excellence Program to run it. <coughs> As I mentioned, um, this was a program created to choose architects for federal buildings. It was never intended for monuments or memorials. Moreover, design excellence is heavily biased toward modernism, something that greatly influenced the selection of the jury. This decision to use the design excellence program was an utter reversal of our tradition of public competitions for national memorials. Only licensed architects could enter it was also a qualifications-based uh, qualifications competition. At no point in the competition was an entrant required to submit an actual design proposal. Instead, the emphasis was on the entrant's previous works and reputation, all factors that favor the architectural elite. Yet one does not need to be an experienced architect to come up with a brilliant memorial. One can be a student, a sculptor, an amateur. Not only was the competition severely restricted as to who could enter, it was a closed competition that solicited only 44 entrants. This is hundreds fewer than the number of entries in open competitions for previous national memorials. For instance, there were 1,400 for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, 400 for the World War II Memorial, and 900 for the MLK Memorial. It was also a secretive process. To this day, we have never seen what Gary submitted. For instance, how did he describe his design philosophy? Thanks to a Freedom of Information Act investigation we undertook of GSA, NCIS determined that the competition violated the agency's own rules and regulations in numerous ways, all of which would favor an architect like Gary. Now, it's possible that the Eisenhower Commission could have rejected the competition jury's decision. However, who were they to say no to the world's most famous architect? And how could they say no to those supposed art and architecture critics on the jury? As for the memorial itself, it's to be located uh, just off the National Mall, across Independence Avenue, south of the Air and Space Museum, on a four-acre lot. The Capitol building, well, here is the Air and Space Museum. Here is the site. Here's the Hirschhorn. And the Capitol building is uh, right over here. So it's on a, a, an important, important vista. This is Maryland Avenue, which points directly to the Capitol building. And Maryland Avenue was designed to be the sister avenue of Pennsylvania Avenue. Here's a, a closer view of the site. To the north, again, is the Air and Space Museum. And to the south is the Department of Education building. This is the original design for the memorial. 
We're looking south, that's the education building in the rear. The main feature of the memorial um, are, were these giant so-called tapestries uh, made of steel, woven steel mesh upheld by a grid. And this tapestry is 447 feet long and they and the pillars are 80 feet high. The pillars, I don't like to call them columns since they have no decoration whatsoever, are 10 feet wide. Um, this main tapestry here is so big, it's larger than the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. It's really hard to imagine just how big this is. And these side panels are bigger than basketball courts. There's another angle looking toward the west. Leon Creer did a, a scale study showing that the memorial is so big you could fit the Lincoln, um, Jefferson, and Washington Monument inside of it. Here I had someone do a rendering, imaginary rendering of what this design would look on American currency. It doesn't look like much. Here's an angle looking up Maryland Avenue. Here you can s get a sense of just how big the columns are. Here are people. I think it's fair to say that this just ruins the vista. Also to get a sense of how big those columns are, maybe you've been to the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. These columns, and here you can see people below, these columns are 72 feet tall by 8 feet wide and the ones we're talking about that Gary's design are 10 feet wide by 80 feet. They're even taller. And that, incidentally, is a sculpture uh, Gary once put in the museum. So he knows exactly about these columns. Here's another scale. I inserted this person here who is uh, five and a half feet. Here, this is, I'll, I'll talk about it, but this is the final design where those side panels have been removed. And now we just get these Free, like a single freestanding column at the corners of the memorial. Here's a close-up of that person. In the original design, the, the sole statue of President Eisenhower was going to depict him as a life-size seven-year-old boy seated on a quote-unquote plank. And then there were going to be bas-reliefs of Eisenhower as president and as supreme allied commander. Now, the, the idea behind this is Eisenhower's first political speech was called Dreams of a Barefoot Boy. It was really kind of political hokum. Eisenhower never liked Kansas, but he wanted to become president. And Gary uh, jumped on that. Um, and in fact, people have largely forgotten this. His original collaborator on this memorial was Robert Wilson, the, uh, the theater designer, who was very avant-garde. And it's unclear which of them plopped down a little tiny man in the memorial uh, model. We, one of the first things the National Civic Arts Society did was highlight this uh, statue, and it helped cause the, uh, an explosion in the controversy, the idea that Eisenhower is going to be portrayed like Tom Sawyer, totally barefoot. And here you can also see just a, a sense of how big those columns are and how they would be towering over this little boy. Um, this is not a very accurate rendering. They don't like to show just how bad the tapestry will look. Here are those tapestries. Um, they're going to have a landscape of what's alleged to be Kansas, but you might say it might as well be Kazakhstan. It's un unrecognizable. It's going to feature these trees, and as you can see, they don't have leaves on them. Unfortunately, you know, what is the allegory of trees in winter? I would say it's not a positive one. It's an allegory for hopelessness or death. Here is the actual tapestry image that they're going to be putting on that, that main tapestry. I don't think it looks like much. And then you also have this strange phenomenon that you're going to have a tapestry of trees and the landscaping of the memorial is going to be a bunch of trees. It's just trees every which way you look. Here they're doing some testing on the tapestry. You see just how much trash is going to get stuck <laughs> in it. And they, you can just imagine what pigeons are going to do they found that they had to use a high pressure washer to clean it. But for some reason, nobody really cared. Here's an up close image of what that woven steel will look like. 
Here's the final design for the memorial. As you can see, the side panels have been removed. They're just these two freestanding columns. And in the middle is this memorial core. Another angle. Here is a rendering we created showing what one of those columns will look like when you're driving along Independence Avenue. You might say it looks like an incomplete highway overpass. Maybe a joke about the interstate highway um, which Eisenhower created. Here's the memorial core. The little boy has now been slightly improved. It's Eisenhower as a, they say he's a young man, but he's really a teenager. And here is a statues of Eisenhower. Here's a statue of Eisenhower as president and his advisors. And here he is as supreme allied commander. And behind them are bas-reliefs with these blocks that have been twisted. And we'll have quotations on them. Here's an image of Eisenhower as the teen dreamer, because this is again about the Eisenhower dreaming about his future. Here's the <laughs> art itself. I think it's fair to say unrecognizable as Eisenhower. It's not like he was Shirley Temple or someone who we know what looked like as a as a child. And I, you know, I have described this as a sentimental piece of kitsch fit for a snow globe. Here he is as Supreme Allied Commander. Behind him is a very shallow bas relief of the ships on D Day. And this, um, these statues are obviously inspired by that iconic photograph of Eisenhower talking to the paratroopers bef um, before D Day. Not many people know that he was actually talking about golf when he was speaking to them. Here's a close up. I think it's fair to say it's not the best sculptures in the world. Here he is as president in front of a map of the world. Okay. Now you might ask, what exactly is the concept, the supposed concept of the memorial? Gary uh, described it as being a kind of theater for cars, sort of a drive-by memorial, I would say. I mean, of course, Gary is from Los Angeles, where cars are very important. He's also to set, set its design on the model of an object in a temple, where somehow those columns are the temple. I would say it's a destroyed temple with the little tiny Eisenhower in the middle. He's also described as being some kind of urban room. I think it's just as likely that the design was an abstract art object that he created and then rationalized after the fact. And given the insignificance of Eisenhower and the design relative to the columns and tapestries. Some people have said that the design is a memorial to Gary and not to Eisenhower. I should note that the memorial is now estimated to cost $150 million. To turn to the controversy, as of the summer of 2011, the memorial was a fait accompli likely to break ground in the next year. It was flying below the radar and if all went as planned, it was going to open to the public on Memorial Day 2015. That summer, in conjunction with the Mid-Atlantic chapter of ICA, the National Civic Art Society hosted a counter competition that solicited classical designs. What we aimed to do was show what an alternative classical design would look like. We were not choosing an official alternative. Here are some of the entries we received. All different kinds of classical memorials. It's a bit dramatic with the cape. Maybe Eisenhower wasn't that dramatic. <laughs> Here we have some actual symbolism, which did not exist on the other design. You know, for instance, a five-pointed star. Significantly, Susan Eisenhower, the president's granddaughter, spoke at our award ceremony. It was the first time she had associated herself with the memorial's opposition. We'd like to think um, it was the first time she realized that there could be an alternative. Perhaps not coincidentally, that fall her brother David resigned in protest from the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. We'd like to think it was um, 
Oh, and I should say, and the entire Eisenhower family came out against the design. In January, National Civic Art Society published a 150-page report on everything wrong with Memorial, everything from the competition to the design to the costs to the maintenance issues to the federal agency approval process. It was part polemic, part extensively footnoted investigative report. We distributed it widely on Capitol Hill and to the media. Subsequently, that, along with the Eisenhower family's opposition, called, caused the controversy to explode. There were numerous op-eds and news articles, editorials, and letters to the editor. NCIS testified at two House hearings. We also instigated a House oversight investigation of the competition. Numerous pundits positively referred to our report and repeated our claims and even catchphrases, though sometimes without attribution. At one point, CBS this morning even used our terminology and described the memorial as an iron curtain. This was a pun I created, the idea that it's a steel curtain. Let's call this an iron curtain, which would be unfortunate given the Cold War politics of the time. We developed an excellent relationship with the press and received fair coverage from the New York Times, <coughs> Architect Magazine, Architectural Record, and similar publications. Although President Obama has never con commented on the memorial, he did appoint Bruce Cole who sits on our Board of Advisors to the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Uh, Bruce had been a vociferous opponent of the design, which the President surely knew. Having him on the Commission has been a tremendous boon for us. This has been a strange memorial controversy in that there is almost no one defending the design itself. The vast majority of pundits and the public are on our side. As the New Yorker reported, quote, the design has managed to achieve something rare in Washington in true bipartisan spirit, almost everyone hates it. Even a number of mainstream architecture critics came out against it, including Robert Campbell of the Boston Globe. Um, turns out that Frank Gehry, uh, Paul, Goldberg, Paul Goldberger reports in his recent biography, was disturbed that more of his friends didn't come out in defense of the design. And in that biography, Goldberger suggests that this is an example of Babe Ruth striking out. As for Congress, in 2012, a bill was proposed in the House of Representatives that would have rebooted the memorial with a new open competition. The bill passed the full House Natural Resources Committee, but it never went to the floor for a vote. That committee also launched its own oversight investigation that heavily relied upon our 150-page report and the results of our Freedom of Information Act investigations. In addition to our work in Congress, NCAS got heavily involved in the federal agency approval process. There were two agencies that needed to approve the design. One of them is the Commission of Fine Arts, which is intended to be the aesthetic guardians of Washington, D.C. Um, it's populated by architects and archi um, artists and so on. The other agency was the National Capital Planning Commission. We testified repeatedly in front of both. One of the things we presented to these agencies were renderings we created that showed what the design would actually look like. Um, so often, or typically, the Eisenhower Commission and Gary would hide the columns with trees in every rendering they released. They never wanted people to see just how big they would be. While we hoped to kill or at least improve the design, our main goal was to slow down the approval process until Congress could take action. Um, especially with regard to appropriations. We did, in fact, cause a major improvement in, an, in the design that slowed its development. The Commission of Fine Arts, uh, um, I should preface this with, has a policy that forbids members of the public from using visual demonstrations with their testimony. Nonetheless, at one of the meetings during my testimony, I simply walked up to the commissioners and gave them a handout. It included uh, damning images of the design that focused on the side panels and the pillars holding them up. Two commissioners, including the chairman, said my handout was compelling. At a subsequent meeting, one commissioner, Alex Krieger, who was a professor, professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, judged the plan according to the standards of a, quote, traditional first semester architecture exercise. He emphatically said this would fail. It would fail. Krieger complained that each iteration of the design had made it worse. He accused the side panels of flapping in the breeze and asked Gary to remove them. He also said that their colossal columns could be, quote, gigantic chimneys that might be disguising an underground power plant. Two other commissioners seconded his remarks, including the chairman. 
The commission ultimately called for Gary to remove those side panels, a demand that the National Capital Planning Commission would, would later endorse, and Gary subsequently removed those panels. In the end, however, the Commission of Fine Arts and the National Capital Planning Commission did give final approval to the design. Basically, both of them pilloried the design, but at the end just approved it. That's often the sort of thing that they do. However, construction of the memorial cannot begin unless the Eisenhower Commission has the full $150 million it needs to complete the memorial. Since they've already been appropriated $60 million, they need to raise about, um, well, let's do the math here, um, 90 million. <laughs> the great news is that for the last years, the last three years, Congress has zeroed all construction funds for the memorial. This is what has happened since the controversy began. Not only that, the last two House budgets have explicitly called for rebooting the memorial, killing the design, and specifically rebooting it with an open competition. Also, private fundraising has been an utter disaster. Less than $5 million has been raised, probably a lot less than that. Gary's design has really only two champions. One of them is Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas. He's now chairman of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. And the other one is former Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, also of Kansas. Neither of them ever praises the design itself. Rather, their argument is, we got to build it for the veterans. We have to build it as soon as possible. They don't care what it looks like. They just want to complete it. I'm proud to say that NCIS has gotten under Dole's skin um, in an op-ed in Roll Call. He called us gadflies and said we should buzz off. We are now stuck in a war of attrition, and each day we get closer to winning. We are happy to report that not only are we close to victory, there have already been positive repercussions outside the memorial. Thanks to our activism, the organizers of the National World War I Memorial underway decided not to use GSA to run their competition, even though GSA lobbied for the job. The organizers also chose to hold an open, blindly reviewed design competition. Furthermore, the competition brief gave classicists a fair shot. The competition, in fact, drew over 30 classical entries, and one of them was selected as one of the seven finalists. Although the winning design has a modernist plan, the design's main feature is its artwork, which is thoroughly classical. The memorial will feature enormous bas-reliefs, and at its center, a statue of three soldiers firing a cannon. The, the, sculpture, the sculptor for the memorial, those parts of the memorial, is Sabin Howard, and here's a sketch he made of part of the bas-relief. Now, Eisenhower Memorial Fight shows that even a small group of people can start a campaign that results in a major symbolic victory. Here we are, defeating the world's most famous architect in a national presidential memorial. Democracy has worked. Our leaders have finally paid attention and done the right thing. The only question is, will they continue to do so? Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I wonder if you could, uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on why it is uh, that uh, an architecture that is basically uh, in the default architecture for the world for two millennia gave up so easily in the case of uh, the ridiculous arguments of the modernists in the 1930s, 40s. Well, I mean, that's a complicated question. Certainly in Europe, there was a sense of demoralization that the continent had imploded, self-destructed, and many people wanted to just abandon the past in so many ways. They wanted a fresh start, and modernist architecture represented that. I think that was a major influence. Also, there's um, some truth to the fact that the classical tradition had lost some of its um, momentum that we started getting into the strip classical style, which to my mind is sort of classicism becoming more modernist. Um, I don't know if I have more answers to that. It, it is interesting that these revolutionary ideologies, which I mentioned, ultimately turned into um, corporate architecture. So it went from sort of socialism and anarchism and who knows what to then becoming the architecture of capitalism and international business. And then now more recently, star architecture is, you might say, the architecture, architecture of globalism.
of, of transnational corporations. That's, that's the best answer I can give you. Anyone else? Justin, could you mention how easy it is to become a mem member of the uh, NCAS? Um, well, you can go to our website and sign up there, or you can talk to me after the meeting. And how inexpensive it is. Oh, well, you can, you can become a member for as cheap as $50, though, of course, the more you contribute, the more we can fight um, the Eisenhower Memorial and similar fights like that. Great. And um, Sheldon, I'm, I, on the way out, I just wanted to mention that we have some pamphlets to tell more if you're new to the ICAA and um, you want to know a little bit more about the national organization and what we do, just grab a pamphlet on the way out. And I want to thank you all so much for coming. And thank you. You are awesome. Well, thank you very much.